Okay, sounds good. Um, let's get started. Um, this webinar is about the new features coming out in the BIND 9.11 version, which is uh, has been out for beta for quite some time, and we posted a release candidate just yesterday. So uh, someone just asked if the webinar will be recorded. It is going to be recorded. Um, we record all of these and post them on the ISC website. We also have a YouTube channel, and it will be up on the YouTube channel as well. It will take, uh, typically it takes us a couple of days. We have to download the recording and transcode it and then post it, but uh, it'll be up there in a few days. Um, everyone who's on the webinar, uh, except for myself, um, and uh, uh, one or more of my ISC colleagues are muted. Um, this is just to improve the audio quality for everyone. We don't want to discourage questions. In fact, uh, we want questions, and if you type them into the Q&A tab over on the right side of the WebEx screen, we will either uh, answer them as we go along or read the questions at the end of the webinar and answer them uh, one at a time. <clears throat> okay, um, that's my picture at the top. Um, the other guy I pictured, though, is uh, probably in bed because it's the middle of the night for him. Um, so uh, in this webinar, I have uh, Mark Andrews, who is uh, probably well known to most of you as uh, a longtime uh, BIND maintainer and uh, senior software engineer here at ISC. And I do have his picture in here, right here. Um, I just, as we got started, I just wanted to remind you all of the team who is working on BIND for you. Uh, the, the four gentlemen across the top are the core software developers for BIND. Um, and on the bottom is kind of the uh, supporting team, um, our director of software engineering on the left. In the center are two QA engineers. And on the right, Ray Bellis, who is a, a DNS research fellow, is also kind of a part of the extended BIND team, although he's not actually a developer on the project. Um, and I wanted to point out that um, since 2015, we have added three new people to the team. So we actually have added resources working on BIND. And that's part of the reason that we're able to bring you so many new features in this release. And uh, before we talk about the 9.11 release, I just wanted to show you the bigger picture. It has been two and a half years since we came out with the last major release of BIND, uh, 9.10 in early 2014. Um, at this time, we're supporting, or we will be supporting, 9.11, the 9.10 train, and the 9.9 train, as well as our uh, subscriber version the dash S versions pictured in green. The 9.8 train is end of life and has been for some time. Uh, hopefully none of you here on the webinar are still running 9.8. If you are, it's time to update. Um, the 9.9 train is our extended support version. Um, you can see that's quite a long-lived train and we will be supporting that through the end of 2017. I did a few statistics about what uh, what has been added in 9.9 um, from our issue tracker. Uh, you see quite a large number of bug fixes um, and uh, really quite a surprising number of new features and feature changes. Um, most of these fixes uh, and some of the feature changes have appeared in prior maintenance versions, but a lot of the features are new for 9.11. So uh, here's the focus of the webinar, the new features that are coming in 9.11. Uh, I've kind of grouped them into three buckets, um, things that help with zone provisioning, uh, additional features to make it easier to manage uh, DNSX, signed, uh, DNSX signed zones, and a miscellaneous category of which there are many other features. So first of all, um, the big focus in uh, this release is on addressing provisioning challenges. Uh, a lot of bind users are um, hosting zones. Um, we have a number of uh, TLDs that use uh, bind. Um, and uh, 
Increasingly, we see installations with a large number of servers. Uh, these folks have to maintain the zone list on the master and also have to use some mechanism for updating the zone list across the pool of slaves. Um, especially in these larger implementations, we have been hearing reports that there is a problem with the notified traffic overhead, uh, particularly if there is a multi-tiered system. Um, so this is a picture, I've, I've attempted to draw a couple of simplified diagrams about how people uh, manage their zones today. I, I hope this is helpful, um, uh, but if this doesn't match what you do, uh, that's not a problem. So uh, today, um, of course, we provide the standard X for X for me mechanism for updating the zone content on the slaves from the master but it's left to the user to figure out a process or a script for maintaining the list of zones on the slave. So people typically use one of two methods. Either they use the RNDC interface on bind and um, connect with both the master and the slave to add the new zones, or they use uh, namedy.conf and they have, uh, perhaps using include files or something, they have some mechanism for updating the namedy.conf file on the slaves. So the way that most people manage this involves some kind of scripts that they write in their own enterprise. Um, uh, I think this is uh, pretty rewarding. It is not uh, certainly not an impossible task, uh, but over time, uh, sometimes the scripts break. And in fact, uh, at ISC, we have a, a small consulting service and frequently when we're called, it's because the script has broken and the engineer that wrote it has moved on or left the company and nobody really remembers what the script did, but all of a sudden the provisioning doesn't work anymore. And this is because we have, as I said, left it to the user to solve this problem. <clears throat> so what we've done with catalog zones is hopefully uh, uh, take over this task for you. Um, Catalog Zone is uh, an implementation of an idea that Paul Vixie first proposed uh, over 10 years ago. At the time, he called it MetaZones. Um, a Catalog Zone is a new zone on the master. It is in a special new format, and it contains a list of all the zones on the master. Um, because it's treated by bind, just like another zone, updates to this zone are propagated to the slaves, just the same using just the same mechanism that you've been using to update the zone content. I have a couple of slides here that uh, sort of animate, uh, you know, show how this works. So first you add the zones to the master and we're providing you with a Python script that will allow you um, to add the zone to the master and add it to the catalog zone at the same time. So on the master, you have to add your new zone both to the list of zones on the master and again to this catalog zone. The catalog zone contains essentially the configuration information for the zone. As I said, a, a catalog zone is, is treated like, a, like any other zone by bind. Go ahead. Then you go to the slave and you configure on the slave um, which zone on the master to refer to as the catalog zone. And this shows you the configuration that you have to do. It's uh, really um, quite minimal, should look fairly familiar. Then um, when the X for X for process kicks off and the, uh, uh, the uh, master, is, uh, master updates are sent to the slave, those updates will include and the catalog zone file information. So any new member zones that were added to the master, that were added to the catalog zone on the master, will be added to the slaves. Uh, the same thing works with zone deletion. Of course, you delete a zone from the master and delete it from the catalog zone on the master. And then as the catalog is updated on the slave, it's also, that zone is also removed from the slaves. So same process. Okay, keep going. 
Well, one of the advantages of putting your zones in these uh, catalog zones is that it, it can potentially make it uh, easier to manage having multiple different catalogs, uh, particularly for a large implementation. If you have some slaves uh, slaving just part of the zones on the master, it can get confusing maintaining and updating those, and this is an easy way to organize those. Uh, one question that's been asked is, does this work with a transfer hierarchy? If you have a set of machines that are really there just for the purpose of uh, transferring zones, uh, and in a big implementation you might have quite a few of these transfer servers, uh, they're not answering queries that are just doing the X for Axer, and this does work with that. Um, one of the use cases that is most, uh, where catalog zones is particularly helpful is in adding new slaves. So when you add another slave to your uh, pool, all you have to do is add the configuration that we showed for the catalog zone on the slave, uh, tell it you know, which file to read, which, which um, file to read from the master for the catalog zone, and then um, when it's updated it will automatically load all of those zones. Today, the, uh, this is obviously our first implementation of catalog zones. It supports what we think are all the basic, um, most commonly used zone options, but it doesn't support every zone option that is possible. It's also not possible to put RPZ zones in catalog zones, and you can't put catalog zones in other catalog zones. Uh, so we hope that that will enable some folks to retire their uh, scripts for updating their slave catalogs. Um, I mentioned um, uh, the uh, deployment model where you have a layer of transfer servers. Um, we have had reports from people that there have that the overhead of all of those notifies can cause some problems, and uh, we're going to talk about that next. So this uh, little graphic is intended to show that if you have uh, a decent number of slaves and you have transfer servers and uh, you have frequent, frequent changes with a lot of updates, uh, you can see a fair amount of traffic from the notifies. So um, there's two things that we've done in the 9.11 version. Uh, we already had the ability to uh, uh, establish uh, a rate uh, to rate limit your notifies, and we've added a separate queue for startup uh, notifies, so that if you want to uh, uh, perhaps throttle your notifies more when you're restarting a server, you can do that. The other thing we've done is we have changed our algorithm so that we um, uh, first will issue the uh, notifies for the last in, uh, using the last in first out model rather than a first in first out, so the most recent updates uh, will go out first. So switching gears a little bit, I want to talk about RNDC. I assume, I guess I don't know this, but I assume that when we first implemented RNDC, it was really aimed at an individual operator sitting at a terminal uh, who was making these remote changes, and they would um, uh, add a zone. Uh, if there was a failure and the zone add didn't work, they were able to use other tools, DIG or other tools, to find out what the problem was. Um, increasingly, though, people are using RNDC as an automation interface, and they really need a more complete um, ability for uh, a program um, to do all the provisioning via the RNDC interface. So uh, we've added a number of new RNDC commands, which will allow you to do things like uh, first check and see if a zone exists. So you can tell if the failure is that you're trying to modify a zone that doesn't exist. Uh, to show the current zone configuration, to modify an existing zone. So previously you could add or remove zones. Now you can also modify them. Um, and we also have added a new read-only mode, um, which would allow you to let some applications uh, have access uh, just to read the zone information, but not allow them to delete or change zone information. 
Another thing that we've added um, which should help with automation is a Python module. This Python module can access any of the uh, commands that you can do over RNDCs, not limited to provisioning. Um, and uh, one of the advantages is that with the Python module, you'll open a connection and you can issue a whole series of RNDC commands over that single connection. So you don't have to set up a new connection every time you make an RNDC command. Another thing that we had heard from some of our authoritative users is that um, uh, the zones that they had added via RNDC uh, took so much longer to delete took so much longer to delete the zones than it took to add the zones that sometimes they were having to batch up uh, the deletion uh, jobs for low traffic times, like the middle of the night. Uh, this is because zones that are added via RNDC are stored in what we call a new zone file. Um, I think at some point these were called temporary zones. In, in any case, um, this new zone file was a text file, and or is a text file, and so we have to walk all the way through the text file to find the zone that you want to delete before we can delete it. So um, what we've done is offer you the option now of uh, compiling it with the LMDB database, the Lightning Memory, I can't even say that, but the uh, LMDB database, um, this is uh, something that you only need to do if uh, deleting zones added via RNDC uh, is time consuming on your system. Uh, but if it is, this will completely eliminate the problem. So um, we did put a, a pretty substantial focus on addressing all of the provisioning challenges uh, that we had heard about in the 9.11 release. And um, I hope that you'll find that uh, now, uh, whether you want to use catalog zones, whether you want to uh, do your provisioning via RNDC uh, that we have uh, offered an improved solution for you. We have had for a long time an option to, uh, to serve the zones from an external database using the DLZ interface. Uh, DLZ, I believe, was a, a contribution uh, to BIND uh, many years ago um, that stores the zone files in a text format. Uh, so that they have to be compiled after they're retrieved before we can uh, answer queries with them. So this is a fairly low performance solution. Um, meanwhile, there are some uh, deployment models that uh, where a database backend is a much more natural choice. Um, I know uh, this is the preferred method for power DNS users. And OpenStack has adopted this model uh, where all of the zones are stored in a database and then they're trying to support multiple different DNS servers uh, serving those zones. So we wanted to get a higher performance uh, database backend. Some people, uh, it's really a deployment choice um, whether or not you prefer a database backend. There are some uh, database specific tools and in particular uh, uh, multi-master or database clusters as a, a popular, popularly cited as a reason to use a database backend. So our friends at Red Hat um, have been uh, supporting for, for several years uh, an LDAP backend for BIND uh, using what they call the DynDB interface. And I've got the URL there uh, listed on the fourth bullet. Um, this is part of Red Hat's free IPA project. Uh, they came to us with a contribution and uh, we actually uh, worked back and forth with them for about a year, um, and they updated it quite substantially uh, so that now this interface uh, can be used, as I said, it is supported today with an LDAP backend uh, through this free IPA project, uh, but this interface can be adapted for other database backends as well. Um, the great benefit is that the performance is virtually the same as native find zone files. And all of your other bind features work uh, just fine, um, including uh, inline signing. So if anyone out there is interested in working on uh, another database backend, 
um, using this uh, interface, we'd love to talk to you. So um, I'm going to try to summarize here what your options are. As I mentioned, uh, first of all, uh, in the blue, this is really the, the current options, uh, either RNDC adding zones to, to bind you that would go into a new zone file, um, or editing uh, namedy.conf. Um, you would still update the master in one of your traditional ways via RNDC or by editing namedy.conf, but now if you also create uh, this catalog zone file on the master, that will be automatically synced to the slave, so you don't have to separately provision new zones on the slaves at all anymore. And then finally, this other option, um, uh, the database backend uh, using this uh, DynDB interface uh, is a much higher performance uh, option now and therefore available to some larger deployments than it was previously. So um, in summary, um, I wanted to remind you that with the 9.10, the prior uh, train, we did add this map format, um, which does uh, increase the speed with which you can load zones when you restart. Um, and those traditional uh, bind zone files can also now be removed with RNDC. Uh, RNDC Dell Zone can also remove uh, zone files that are in namedy.conf. That change doesn't persist across a restart until you actually edit namedy.conf, but you can uh, remove them on the fly with RNDC. Um, the uh, uh, new zones that have been added via RNDC can now be uh, deleted much faster if you compile with the LMDB database. Um, your zones will now be propagated to the slaves if you choose to use the catalog zone feature. We've made a, a number of uh, additions to the RNDC interface, uh, many of them specific for provisioning. Um, and again, there's now a, a high performance option uh, for storing your zones in an external database. So moving on to talk about some of the other new features in 9.11, uh, perennial topic is DNSSEC. We have over the years put a lot of work into making uh, a full feature DNSSEC implementation and bind, and uh, we're continuing to uh, add features to make it uh, easier to uh, deploy and maintain DNSSEC. So the first of those is a new utility called the DNSSEC Key Manager. And this is a Python script. Um, uh, we recommend that you uh, schedule it in a cron job and perhaps run it uh, on a daily basis. And so what this will do on a daily basis is uh, inhale this policy definition file we'll talk about in a minute, and uh, then examine the uh, current uh, DNSSEC um, uh, implementation in BIND and just ensure that the zones keys match the policy for each zone. Um, this means that uh, the script will create new keys when necessary, and if you change the policy, it will correct all applicable keys. So what this is supposed to do is automate the repetitive maintenance, ta maintenance tasks associated with maintaining your DNSSEC over time. This uh, policy definition file allows you to create different classes. If you might have some zones that um, need higher security, perhaps they have a different uh, default key size, uh, perhaps they have a different algorithm, um, uh, perhaps you want to have the uh, uh, signatures valid for a much longer period of time, uh, uh, you might want to have uh, uh, more or less uh, overlap in, as far as the pre-publish and the post-publish time. Um, uh, so these are all things that you can set in your uh, policy definition file. And this is a utility, this is a Python utility that um, was partly written um, uh, during a, an IETF hackathon, and uh, we want to thank Sebastian Castro from .nz who uh, helped us work on this tool. 
So another unsolved problem in DNSSEC is um, how do you update your parent? Um, this is something that's been hotly debated uh, in the IETF uh, uh, for years. Uh, the complexity is that uh, there's so many different relationships uh, between the operator of the parent and child. Um, and this information has to be transmitted securely to the parent. So this is, um, you know, once you implement DNSSEC on your own zones, you have to uh, inform your parent. Uh, uh, so today this is often a manual process, uh, frequently using a web portal. So you might have to, uh, once you um, uh, update your own zones, you might have to go to a web portal and manually put in some information to update the parent. Uh, so what we have done, we have implemented an IETF draft uh, for parent-child updating. And this requires that uh, the child uh, publishes uh, uh, two new um, resource records, the, the CDS and the CDS key, um, and then the parent can uh, query, can poll for those uh, records, and use that information uh, to populate uh, the DS uh, or the DNS key information at the parent. Um, it's really just a choice of, uh, you know, the uh, operator or the parent, which, they pre which method they prefer. So we've implemented the uh, capability on the child um, to create these records automatically when you do your uh, KSK rollover. It's really up to the parent to implement some kind of polling and uh, updating using this. And we have heard from some folks that are, are working on systems like that that this is certainly coming. So uh, finally, um, you know, uh, if you're having trouble maintaining your uh, DNSSEC uh, implementation, maybe you, you know, needed help with the automated uh, um, key maintenance, or maybe you have failed to update your parent when you have rolled over your keys um, and your domain stops uh, uh, validating, what, what happens in practice is users complain to the operator of the validating resolver. And um, uh, most of the time, you know, the, the secure domain wasn't hacked or anything. There was just an administrative error that caused it to stop validating. Uh, the problem is this puts pressure on the resolver operators uh, because users say, how come I can no longer, uh, I can no longer uh, uh, find this website uh, through your resolver? Uh, so um, Comcast and others who uh, were early in deploying DNSSEC have um, uh, proposed a new feature, the negative trust anchor. Um, this is a way that the resolver operator can temporarily disable the DNSSEC validation for a specific domain. Um, uh, this is intended to be uh, temporary. Um, the default is an hour. You can extend it up to a week. Um, we do have a feature that will periodically check to see if the uh, domain can now validate. And if it can, it will remove the negative trust anchor. Uh, you can disable this feature if you like. There is also some uh, telemetry um, whereby we will send on a daily basis uh, queries to the owner of the zone, um, uh, basically alerting them to the fact that there's a, a negative trust anchor in place uh, for their domain. Okay, um, those are the, the major um, new features for DNSSEC uh, authoritative uh, providers and also for validating resolvers, uh, but we have still a lot of other new features in 9.11. So let's see what else is in there. DNS tap. Uh, we have had many requests for support for DNS tap. DNS tap is an independent project um, uh, that uh, provides a flexible method for capturing and logging DNS traffic. Um, so uh, DNS tap will log both the query and the response um, because it understands DNS. It's designed for DNS. Uh, it has more intelligence than a standard wire packet capture, 
so the information is um, uh, much easier to interpret. Um, it has the promise of having lower overhead than bind logging, particularly if you're looking for responses as well as queries, of course. Um, uh, and it works across bind, not and unbound. As I mentioned, this is an independent project, um, and uh, not and unbound have already implemented support for DNS tap, and now that bind has also. Um, operators who are um, working with multiple DNS systems will be able to have uh, equivalent uh, logs across these. I'll move on. So you have uh, two choices. You can um, send your log output either to a socket or to a file. Uh, depending on which way you go, that changes uh, how you can manage your log files. So um, when the DNS tap output is being written to a file, uh, we are providing you with a way of rolling the log file via RNDC. So um, uh, this does require that you pay attention and uh, RNDC, uh, issue this RNDC DNS tap dash roll command when you want to roll the log files. So the log file will be created um, with a suffix like a dot zero uh, that will be incremented in a new uh, file created with a dot one suffix or .2, .3, .4, uh, and so on. Um, we want to point out that DNS tap is designed to drop logs rather than block operations so that you're not surprised if uh, your log files are not uh, complete. Uh, sometimes they may drop information. Um, we provided a DNS tap read utility that makes the log files human readable, and this was um, uh, described in the um, webinar that we did back in the spring. I think on the next slide, we have a link to the webinar. Uh, that's the top bullet. Uh, DNS tap was developed by Robert Edmonds when he was at Foresight Security. Uh, there's a website for DNS tap, dnstap.info, and we have uh, an article in our knowledge base about using DNS tap with Bind, which has been uh, just recently updated with information about how to do the log file rolling. So um, another perennial problem um, in IP networking generally really is uh, dealing with uh, spoofed um, IP addresses. Um, so uh, obviously most of your uh, DNS queries are typically going to be UDP and you can't be sure that the address isn't spoofed. Uh, this is a problem because frequently when people are sending you abuse traffic, uh, they pretend to be sending it from some other IP address. So in Bind, um, we already have implemented a number of mechanisms uh, to um, uh, ensure that the client is not using a spoofed address. Uh, these are not things that you have to do anything about. It just happens automatically. We use uh, source port randomization. Um, we check the question um, uh, from the client, uh, make sure that they're still asking the same question, and we also now are looking for these DNS cookies. Uh, uh, something very similar to cookies was actually implemented in by 9.10 as an experimental feature. In 9.10 we called it the source identity token or the SIT token. Um, so a, when a client um, sends a query to a resolver, uh, if the resolver is looking for a cookie, it will respond saying, that's a bad cookie, please send us a cookie. The client will and, and send a server cookie. Then the client will send a cookie along with a server cookie, and we can validate that and ensure that the client sending us the, the query has received uh, something that we sent to their IP address. So we've ensured that they're not using a spoofed address. Um, uh, just mentioning because it often comes up, of course, not all abuse involves spoofs addresses. Um, there have been uh, plenty of incidents of um, uh, DNS uh, abuses um, being generated or apparently being generated from networks of compromised home gateways, for instance. Uh, in this case, um, you know, the person with a home gateway doesn't even know that their gateway is being reused and there's really uh, 
uh, no need for the attacker to um, disguise the address. So this doesn't help in that kind of case, of course. Um, so there are a number of uh, new commands. Um, actually, I think this is all of them except for um, one that allows you to change the algorithm for the cookie. Um, uh, so you can uh, require on both the resolver and the authoritative bind server, you can require a server cookie. You can require a valid cookie. Um, you can uh, choose whether or not to send a cookie that's on the resolver. Um, and this no cookie UDP size allows you to limit the size of response that you will send without a cookie. Um, uh, so in order to make this more efficient, if you have a cluster of machines, they can all share the cookies if you configure this cookie secret on each of the machines in the cluster. I'm just trying to think if there's something else I was going to say about cookies. Um, oh. Uh, this feature is on in 9.11, so um, uh, both require server cookie and send cookie are on by default now in 9.11. You should unmute Mark in case he wants to add anything. Mark, is there anything that you wanted to add to this uh, discussion of cookies? Uh, not, at the, not at the moment. This is an RSC. Um, this is a DNS cookie is actually an RSC. And we actually have um, TLD operators supporting it at this stage, so um, only a few of them, but they're there, um, so it's coming out. Now, so somebody's already put in a question, what clients currently support DNS cookies? Um, NameD itself is a client, so it does. Um, DIG supports it. Um, at this so stage, I'm not aware of any stub, stub resolvers that do that support it, but right. That's, that's, a, that's, that's a good a good question because um, this is one of those things which it may take a while to catch on across the ecosystem, um, but um, uh, luckily it's uh, it's easy to introduce it. Um, it will just become more valuable over time as uh, more of the participants are supporting cookies. Give us the next slide. So. Um, I was just thinking about the, uh, and someone asked, is there a way to test your cookie setup? Um, I think uh, DIG is probably the best way uh, to test the cookie setup. Yeah, uh, DIG, if you, um, DIG does cookies by default, and um, when you get a, get a reply back, you will see, a, if the server supports it, you'll see a, um, cookie line with either a good or a bad in brackets after it. Um, if it's good, that means that the cl your client cookie was echoed back, which indicates that you talk that you aren't receiving a spoofed response. Um, some ser some servers mishandle ADS options and just echo them back. They'll also be marked as good, but they won't have a server cookie with them. So this is also, this is the version of DIG that's included in 9.11. Um, I know uh, quite a lot of people have downloaded the DIG app that Ray Bellis made that runs on iOS devices like uh, iPhones and iPads, but that is based, I believe, on um, uh, a version of DIG from a 9.10, maybe .2. So I don't think that that uh, will have, uh, I don't think you can use the iPad app to test for cookies at the moment. Um, so I just wanted to mention um, uh, cookies really are minimal overhead um, and they allow you to avoid um, amplified responses to spoof clients. Um, there's really minimal uh, uh, additional uh, round trips involved. Um, once you get a cookie, you can share it amongst your whole, uh, you know, resolver pool. Um, they're very easy to deploy. Um, you know, it's uh, kind of the, the opposite of DNSSEC as far as deployment uh, overhead. Um, and the long-term promise is that, you know, maybe one day as cookies are fully deployed across uh, the whole ecosystem, um, possibly DNS servers can stop uh, source port randomization, which is a fairly expensive um, 
uh, a fairly expensive uh, a defensive uh, maneuver that uh, all the DNS servers have had to implement. Um, uh, the main uh, criticisms of uh, cookies, uh, first of all, like anything else that uses eDNS, um, you know, it can expose eDNS incompatibilities. Um, and certainly it's not a magic bullet. It's a, a kind of a, a lightweight uh, additional tool in um, uh, mitigating and protecting against abuse. And again, uh, it's default to on. Um, one thing I wanted to mention uh, specifically um, on the authoritative side, um, if a client presents with a cookie, we will whitelist that client for rate limiting. And this uh, potentially makes your rate limiting more effective because it's focused uh, on fewer clients. Um, so uh, those clients that present cookies uh, don't have to uh, be included in the rate limiting. So uh, another feature, uh, it's completely different, but also addresses the problem of uh, amplification um, is uh, minimal any. Um, there are a couple of different methods that have been discussed for uh, minimizing responses to any request. And any request uh, typically uh, uh, could result in a response which is very large. Uh, could be, uh, you, you know, you could provide uh, every record that answers that query. Um, instead, uh, thanks to a patch that was contributed by Tony Finch, um, we have an option to provide just a minimal response, uh, uh, arbitrarily select um, an answer. Uh, that is a valid response to the query instead of sending uh, a much larger response. This, um, you might want to unmute Mark for this. This is another of his features. So uh, you know, a lot of people feel like in 2016 it's time to start using IPv6. Um, Prior to uh, 999 and 9104, you could say that BIND had kind of a prejudice in favor of IPv4 uh, because whether the query came in over an IPv4 or an IPv6 connection, we always gave the glue for the A record. So uh, we basically always uh, uh, referred you to use IPv4 uh, for your next query. Uh, we, cha we made that change back in the spring in 999 and 9104. Um, what we're adding now in 9.11 is a change to the smooth round trip time. This is the algorithm that we use for uh, selecting among, um, you know, uh, multiple uh, servers that can answer the query. Um, uh, so what we've done basically is we have given um, an advantage to the um, A record and advantage to the IPv6 path, a 50 millisecond advantage. This, uh, the amount of this head start or this advantage uh, for IPv6, the default is 50 milliseconds, but you can configure it to any value you like. Uh, you can even set it down to zero. I know that uh, some people I've talked to have said that, um, you know, what they would like to do is configure it so that, um, a user will always be, uh, so, so that their systems will always prefer an IPv6 path uh, unless that means that they're going to be sent over a more expensive link. So it may be fairly, uh, you know, deployment specific uh, how you want to handle this. Uh, Mark, did you want to add anything on this? I don't want to misrepresent the uh, feature. No, that's about it. Um... Basically, if you support IPv6, you're supposed to um, preference all your connections over IPv6. The idea is that the traffic will all move to IPv6 rather than IPv, rather than staying in IPv4, so you can actually tell when when you can start to turn off your IPv4 support. Yeah, this is kind of a tipping point thing, um, you know. Uh, it's just going to require a little bit of a nudge to get people to get moving on IPv over IPv6. And again, this is uh, defaulted to on in the 9.11 release. So this is kind of a miscellaneous slide. Um, there are 
so many new features in 9.11. I did not include a list of all of the new dig options. Um, we talked about the uh, uh, dig um, using dig for uh, cookies. There, uh, there are quite a few additional dig options. There's also a new M dig that uh, does exactly what it sounds like. Uh, we'll send a, a series of dig requests. Um, we added a feature uh, specifically to help new users. I think it will help a lot of experienced users too. Um, uh, Karsten Stropman, one of the trainers from Men and Mice, uh, and, and a couple of other folks that uh, do bind training uh, told me that they often saw that users would be working with multiple windows and they would restart bind over and over again without realizing that they had uh, multiple copies of NAMD running at the same time. And obviously this would really uh, get confusing after a while as they updated some of them and not others. So we've added a lock file and if the lock file is present because you've already started a copy of BIND, uh, you won't be able to start another one unless you remove that lock file. So it's just, a, uh, just an aid uh, primarily for novices. Um, well, we have some folks, some CCTLDs that wanted to use uh, uh, low cost uh, PCI card uh, HSMs, hardware security modules uh, for DNSSEC and our PKCS11 interface is fairly strict and um, so we have relaxed uh, some of the requirements on that PKCS11 interface uh, to enable more of these cards to work. Um, uh, this is really a compatibility feature. Um, uh, we are going to be uh, sending the TLS record if it's present um, along okay. in the, yep. That's actually TLSA record. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, uh, the TLSA record um, along with the MX record um, in the additional section. This is um, for uh, uh, encryption between mail servers. Um, this is so you don't have to ask separately for the TLSA record. Um, we made a couple of other changes that improve the uh, efficiency or the performance of BIND, um, support for pipeline TCP queries. Um, uh, some people aren't aware that we have a feature for uh, quantum signing. This is um, uh, so that if you are uh, um, updating a large number of uh, Inline signing a large number of zones at once um, and uh, you're uh, updating this that you can uh, bucketize it into these uh, quanta and um, we have added now uh, a command that allows you to adjust the size of that uh, quantum. Um, Okay, uh, I think that's, so Mark, we had a question earlier on the earlier webinar about the MTU change, um, which I didn't address because I didn't know what to say. I think it probably doesn't affect many people, but um, you want to say anything about that? Um, yeah, basically this was to do with IPv6 MTUs. Um, IPv6, doesn't fragment in the network, and it doesn't fragment packets in the network anymore. And so even for IP, even for UDP, you need to do path empty discovery. And we're trying to tune the server side so that you don't have much path empty discovery occurring, especially when you've got um, encapsulated packets. And Similarly, for IPv, uh, uh, path MD discovery really does impact on the time it takes to get responses back uh, for both UDP and TCP. Um, unfortunately, DNS is very time sensitive, so we've tuned both. We've tuned both the uh, UDP and TCP packet sizes. or more correctly in TCP, the uh, segment size. Okay. To try and avoid um, path MTU discovery. Okay. 
Um, I've added a list of the uh, new um, resource record types. Um, we already talked about the uh, CDS and CDS key records. Um, open PGP key is exactly what it sounds like. Um, SMIME is uh, also uh, for another uh, type of secure email. Um, we add these, um, you know, as they as they come up um, periodically. Uh, finally, I wanted to mention some features of 9.11 that are are really completely invisible. Um, uh, we have added a lot of new functionality, um, but we also have improved our testing on the back end. Um, we have a blog post up on our website uh, from Ray Bellis about the Perf Lab system that he's written that does uh, ongoing continuous performance testing. Um, we test uh, three different scenarios continuously on all of our branches. Um, uh, one scenario has uh, a single very large zone with uh, a million resource records. Another one has uh, a million zones. Uh, very small zones, and another um, uh, scenario is a resolver test scenario. We do this all the time so that if there is a significant regression, we would see it right away. We also have implemented since last summer, uh, in the summer of 2015, the American Fuzzy Lop open source fuzz testing tool was updated to uh, be effective for DNS. We've, we've been doing uh, ongoing fuzz testing since then. Um, and we also have added um, some more complicated build test uh, combinations to our ongoing build testing. Um, I just wanted to have add a word about performance. Um, uh, we do have, uh, as I mentioned in this Perf Lab, a very generic performance testing scenario uh, without any tuning. Um, uh, but we're able at least to see how does one, one version uh, on this baseline compare to the prior version. Um, in general, you should expect as we add features that performance will generally decrease. That's just uh, not a bind specific thing, that's just software. Um, and uh, with the 9.11.0 release, um, we think you should expect to see uh, some decrease in your queries per second versus 9.10. If you have uh, a few uh, very large zones, so this is sort of a TLD scenario, you should expect to see about the same performance as uh, 9.10 um, for a large number of small zones. So this is uh, like a hosting type of scenario. And uh, quite happily, we made some changes that have improved performance um, uh, for resolver operators. So you should actually see uh, higher queries per second in uh, 9.11 versus 9.10. Here are some references. These are some of the RFCs that we've implemented. Um, I talked a lot about catalog zones. Item number three there is a draft. Uh, it is not a standard. It's a draft for catalog zones that we've written in the hopes that some of the other uh, DNS, uh, open source DNS vendors will implement this. Um, and towards the bottom, you see there are uh, links to some of the new articles in our knowledge base uh, for new features in 9.11. Is there anything else? Okay. Um, so in summary, uh, the major features that we have are, of course, the new catalog zone feature. Uh, that's where all the cats come from. Um, many additions to RNDC, uh, some of these are provisioning related, but there are uh, plenty of new RNDC commands in there, not just for provisioning. Uh, the DNS cookies, it has been pointed out to me that those are macaroons and not cookies, but uh, in any case. Um, uh, the support for the DNS tap feature um, from uh, Foresight Security, uh, a number of DNSSEC updates, the new utility, the key manager utility, and uh, the support for parent-child updating. Um, and uh, finally, um, the minimal response to any queries. Um, there are other features that I haven't even mentioned. Uh, if you dive into the release notes, you'll find a lot of stuff in there. 
So we have posted the release candidate for the final already. Um, uh, so if you are planning to download and test, go ahead and do so right now. Um, we did have an issue reported on Windows, uh, just really breaking news. So if you happen to be a Windows user and you want to test on Windows, we would encourage you to do that now and uh, not wait for the release, um, which may be next week or um, uh, just depending. Uh, is there anything else after this? Nope, oh, that's it. Uh, if anybody has any more questions, um, you can type them into the Q&A section here. Let me just look and see what we have in here. Okay, well, last call on the questions. I don't see any more Can questions. Can a 9.11 master management 11 and older slaves at the same time? Okay, somebody asked where you get, where will we post the uh, presentation? Um, we'll post the PDF and the recording on um, the ISC website under the community uh, heading. There's a section for presentations. Um, the recording will take a couple of days, um, uh, but the PDF I can get up uh, quite quickly. Um, okay, so okay, so here's another question: Can the 9.11 master manage 9.11 and older slaves at the same time, a mixed environment. Um, so I think that the uh, question is really, um, do the slaves need to know about the catalog zones? And unfortunately, the slaves do need to know about the catalog zones in order to uh, um, download and use them. So your slaves would have to be updated. Also, um, related to this, I just want to point out that this is a dot zero release. And um, while we're very excited about all the new features in it, um, uh, we do expect that uh, users will uh, consider the size of their deployment and the criticality of it when thinking about what to deploy and uh, probably would, would want to wait for a maintenance release or two before using this on a large system. Um, adding to the catalog zones, um we are in the process of standardizing the contents of these zones through the IETS, so this should become, with luck, generic across the, across multiple um, vendors. Right, but this, the slaves would have to know about the catalog. Yeah, yeah this, the, the, oh, the slaves definitely need to know about it. It's something that needs to be, it needs the explicit support in the name server to make use of it. Right. Uh, I've heard uh, from a lot of folks during the beta who are really excited about deploying this. Um, so I do hope that uh, if any of you are also using another uh, DNS software system that you will ask your developer to consider adding catalog zones to that as well. Okay, any more questions? I'm getting questions that I'm not even seeing. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, I guess we're done. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. And uh, I hope that uh, you find some features that you were looking for in the 9.11 version. Thanks for uh, dialing in, Mark. No problem. <laughs> All right, bye-bye.